Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is the second meeting of the UMBC Cyber Defense Lab for the spring term. And today we have a guest speaker, uh, Kurono Yoshi, who's a uh, assistant professor in the information systems department. Um, we are recording and we'll post the video on the uh, U-Cyber and CDL websites. W welcome and thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. Um, good, good afternoon, rather everyone. Um, so should I share my slides and continue with my presentation? Please. Can everyone see the slides? Yes. So good afternoon. Thank you uh, for having me. Um, uh, and I'm going to speak uh, a little about my research. Um, and of course, I'm open to questions anytime. Uh, if the information is too trivial, just let me know because I don't want to uh, drill down too deep if you already know all the topics. Right? Um, brief uh, introduction about me. Um, I am the UMBC director for the Center for Accelerated Real-Time Analytics, CARTA, which is a NSF-sponsored uh, IUCRC, which is Industry University Collaborative Research Center. Um, and I'm also an associate professor in the Information Systems Department. My research interests were primarily focused on data science, cloud services, security, and health IT. And in my previous role, um, I've had a lot of industry experience working at the International Monetary Fund, managing their um, IT systems, um, as well as being an associate professor in the CSE department. So I'm also affiliated with the CSE department. Um, a bit about our, our research, right? So the research in my lab, which is the um, NAC lab, is focused on data science and cloud computing broadly. Um, and we are focused more on applied research in legal text analytics, in how to automate regulatory um, documents, how to ensure data compliance using blockchains, and then looking at uh, novel encryption approaches for cloud data, securing cloud data. So um, in the domains of health IT and um, uh, compliance automation, that's, that's where our focus has been. And for this talk, I will um, limit it to regulations um, uh, on ontology automation, but I, I would love to discuss uh, other research areas if you're interested. So some of the ongoing projects that we have, which are all funded projects, um, include um, the one on services and regulations and policy uh, analytics, the Sherpa sort of project, um, then how to use attribute-based encryption for cloud uh, electronic health records and data compliance tracking using blockchain. So um, I'll focus on the Serpa uh, project, uh, which looks at how do you automate uh, cloud data protection regulations. And we have looked at how can we develop uh, semantically rich approaches to automate uh, knowledge extraction from these legal documents and represent them using semantic web languages. Um, our vision is to have an integrated data compliance knowledge graph, right? That's the vision of this project that we have been pursuing for almost like uh, since 2013. So it's been a long time, I think almost eight years now. But why, why do we want to do this? And why would the cyber defense lab students be interested in this? Right? So, as you know, that cloud service providers are capturing a huge amount of private information, right? And the cyber information is being captured on daily basis. Um, and to ensure that the uh, users have a seamless experience, right? So they don't have to bother about logging in multiple times or every time entering their you know, credentials. Um, as because of this seamless to ensure the seamless experience, they're tracking not only your um, you know um, login credentials, but also your uh, how are you browsing the website, which links do you click, what do you um, uh, prefer, what um, you know products are you buying, what products can be recommended, and essentially they want to uh, uh, they want to essentially build customer loyalty. So there's no. You know, um, uh, sinister motivation. Um, it is a genuine business uh, need that they believe. But because of this, uh, uh, there's huge amount of private information being captured, right? And to ensure that the customer's consent is uh, taken, they usually have a privacy policy document or a, a security, uh, you know, a cookies policy document. And most of you, if you go to a website, you'll find that, right? We accept cookies, we want your privacy, sign our, agree to our privacy policy. 
and majority of us never read it in detail. Why? Because it's too legalized that the users ignore it. And then uh, they are not even aware of what data is being uh, either repurposed or transformed into some other format um, and then um, further analyzed by the cloud providers or third party providers. So that is a uh, recognized um, as a big challenge and, you know, public is concerned. And so what happens is when the public is concerned, the regulators step in, right? And so now you have lots of protection laws that have come in. Um, the security and privacy concerns that started have resulted in what I call a data compliance forest. So now the providers, the vendors, um, anyone who has a, uh, you know, who's collecting private data on the website has to adhere to lots and lots of regulations. So you have uh, uh, regulations like the NIST data standards, the uh, cloud security alliance standards, PCI DSS, which is the credit card standards, banking law standards, HIPAA, which is the health regulation, um, so that all have to be adhered to as a university, we have to adhere to the, um, the student, uh, you know, regulations, the FERPA regulations, the ADA regulations, etc. Um, and then international um, um, re regulations are coming up that are influencing um, how data is being, uh, you know, shared across the globe. So GDPR, which is the European Union standard um, released in 2018 is one of the big ones, but every country is coming up with their own data protection regulations. And if you are a, a vendor or a organization that is collecting data internationally, you know, you know uh, one of the big uh, giant tech giants, you have to adhere to the data regulation across uh, jurisdictions across the globe. And sometimes these regulations are, are not talking uh, the same language or they are, uh, you know, not in the same uh, space. They are, uh, Privacy as understood in US is different as privacy understood in India and vice versa. Another challenge, technical challenges, these regulations are only text documents. So text documents are wonderful for human beings because we can read, uh, you know, common English, common language and understand and parse what is being expected. But if we were to tell a machine to automatically understand and parse it uh, because of the ambiguity of language, um, machines will not be able to do it. And so there is a big challenge on how do you automate these uh, data protection regulations. And so we have been looking at in our lab um, uh, and our research and how do we can use um, approaches from AI, uh, semantic web, text extraction, uh, natural language processing um, and deep learning um, to ex extract knowledge not just text because text extraction or context extraction is the um, is a big challenge but you know how do you get knowledge out of it so you understand what the regulation is implying and what uh, regulation policies have to be adhered to so we have developed ontology or knowledge representation for various data laws and i'm going to share some in this talk um, which are machine processable they're platform independent, so it really doesn't matter um, which l language or which, uh, you know, infrastructure it's being, um, um, you know, uh, automated on. They are standardized because they are W3C standard on semantic web technology. And we've used um, some reasoning uh, elements and how to automate and uh, particularly understand that uh, the regulation is being complied or not. Um, so the technical goal that we have apart from the grand vision of making this great knowledge presentation, the technical goal that we have is how do you transform or translate uh, laws that are uh, in common language um, in textual format into graph data sets? Because I believe that storing documents in text format is not going to um, be viable when you have big data challenges, right? So if you have a textual document that is to be accessed, processed continuously by huge amount of data, um, you know, uh, uh, sets of data sources, you, a graph data set, a graph process, which is machine processable will work much better in automating that compliance than to have a, you know, textual parsing and then trying to understand the information. So, um, as uh, you might all be aware of the semantic web, uh, you know, framework, uh, it um, enables data to be annotated with machine understandable metadatas and now allows the automation of uh, retrieving the context of the text. So there are various technologies um, and languages that have been developed in Semantic Web. And we have primarily focused on RDF, which is the Resource Description Framework Language, and uh, Web OWL, which is the Web Ontology Language, and also used it with Sparkle, uh, the query language, 
uh, to do generate some uh, reasoning uh, basis um, for our knowledge graph. So that's that's our technical um, um, foundation that we've been focusing on. Um, since compliance and regulatory and data protection laws are in some sense legal texts, um, there are two approaches that we've used on analyzing this. Of course, um, as you all know, supervised approaches and unsupervised. So we looked at uh, using semantic web technology and creating knowledge graphs, um, used NLP to extract key elements that to be populated in the knowledge graph. Um, and uh, this was, uh, uh, you know, more required an expert to validate our uh, technique. Uh, we had a legal um, counsel from an, uh, the agency help us out. Um, to, you know, parse it and say, yes, this makes uh, legal sense. This makes domain sense. Um, the approach that we are taking another approach that we pursued was just looking at unsupervised approaches on extracting information from large text. Right? So, we looked at uh, word embeddings. We looked at word modeling and we looked at basic topic modeling to see if we can identify key terms. Uh, some values, some topics that can be then used to populate the knowledge graph that we created using the supervised approaches. So the supervised approach that we had um, looked uh, or went through three uh, um, foundational uh, approaches. Um, one, we used NLP, uh, you know, simple part of speech tagging, uh, etc., to generate parse trees to understand each regulation. And I'll go in more detail on how we did that. And then we used text mining approaches to extract the key terms and rules that exist in those. Um, um, legal documents and of course, uh, semantic web to store the knowledge. As I told you, the knowledge graph was stored using our RDF and um, sparkle was used to query and reason over the knowledge graph. So, the data sets that we've been working on, we continue work on it is the European Union's GDPR, which is the general data protection regulation. Um, the credit card protection regulation PCI DSS, which is not a. Uh, a uh, regulated docu um, standard, but uh, uh, what we call industry best practice. So this is what the industry uh, standards are. Um, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, HIPAA, which is again by the federal US federal government that uh, mandates or regulates how health uh, care data is shared across um, the caregivers and mobile wallet payments. So this is some of the regulations we looked at. We also try to see if there are, um, you know, um, like the privacy policies and the crowd service level agreements, how can they be automated? Can knowledge be extracted from that? And so we've looked at those policies and in addition to the cyber insurance policies. Now, because of the, this is a uh, long uh, lasting research of almost nine years, as I said, or eight years, no, 22 to nine years. Uh, so I will not be able to cover every data set, but I'll try to at least give you an overview of each uh, as possible. So, but if you are interested in this ontology and would like to get access to it, let me know. It's in public domain and I, I don't mind sharing it. So, let me just focus on uh, simple policy um, elements um, that could be extracted. How, how do you find the regulatory uh, uh, knowledge from it? And so, we took a look at something called the cloud service level, um, uh, cloud service legal documents. We looked at all the cloud um, policies that can influence. So, they are Three types. One are the regulatory compliance standards that uh, influence how cloud data is stored and managed. Uh, then, of course, the privacy and security policies that the cloud vendor may mandate, right? So, this is something the vendor comes up with their own privacy policy or best to use policy, or we may share the data policy, et cetera. And then, individual, when you're purchasing a service, you have the service level agreements on how it is performing, how can you access it, or who can access the data, et cetera. So, those are the terms of service as we call them. And the idea was that if we can get the knowledge from these three various sort of documents, then we can maybe automatically have some reasoning done on that knowledge, right? But what is knowledge? What is the knowledge that is embedded in these three documents, you might ask? And so while uh, after studying them in detail, we found that there are four ways in which knowledge is embedded in these documents. Firstly is the terms of art and their definitions, measures and metrics, and some of the deontic rules that are embedded in these documents and the cross-referencing. So I'll go in detail on those. What is a term of art, right? So every uh, regulatory document or compliance document or um, service level document has some phrases that are specific to that profession or the field, right? So those are the terms of art. So for example, if you were had a cloud service level agreement and you were, you know, AWS cloud, so they may speak about re region unavailable or region available. 
right? So there is a concept of availability zone, which is a term of service that is used by cloud uh, providers. Likewise, a term called service credit. Now, this is not something that is you know completely available in general um, language usage. But there is a specific legal term, which uh, the concept is a service credit. The idea is that if you are using a cloud service and it goes out of, you know, um, work or it is not available, then you are supposed to be getting some refund, right? Um, so what the cloud providers do is they call it the service credit, right? We'll give you some credit, some refund because the service did not work correctly. And so now you can use it in the future. So that's the idea of a service credit. Um, and then there is a definition of what a service credit is and how can um, end user avail of it. So those are some of the terms of art. Then the knowledge is embedded in how the performance of the service is measured, right? So availability of the service, cost of the service, whether the data is encrypted in the service, et cetera. All that influences how the service is perf uh, performing and how the end users are able to avail of it. So the metrics and measures are a great source of knowledge in the um, regulations. Um, and as I told you, uh, policies also contain key terms. So, so what we used, we used a concept of, uh, you know, pattern learning uh, techniques to uh, identify some of the terms that are uh, available that are very specific to the um, knowledge graph, uh, no, to the regulation, but can be potentially an entity or a class in the knowledge graph, right? So we use the CMU link parser to generate a parse tree, which will then compare the various patterns. And then each sentence that fits a pattern like X is a Y, we understood that as key terms. Because if I can say uh, service credit is a um, credit that is given to the uh, end user if the service is not available, so that is a concept would help us extract those phrases. And that's how we were able to extract key terms from the uh, policies. We also use topic description for extraction. So like, uh, you know, uh, topic description approach of noun phrase extraction, we tried to get uh, headings from the documents. The paragraphs may have headings that could give us uh, specific nouns or specific uh, knowledge that can be used. We isolated it and we again uh, generated RDF triples using uh, basic topic extraction approaches. The second knowledge, uh, third knowledge base, as I told you, is the deontic rules. So uh, many regulations and um, policy documents contain what we call deontic um, logic uh, statements. So they are basically um, divided into four parts: uh, permissions, obligations, prohibitions, and dispensations. So permissions are what you rights you have as an end user, what you are allowed to do. Obviously, prohibitions are what you are not allowed to do. Obligations are what actions you have to perform to be able to be permitted to perform another action dispensations are optional or non mandatory so let me give you an example right we all are permitted to drive if we are if we are adults right but uh, to drive we are obligated to get a driver's license so that is one of the obligation you will not be able to drive unless you have a driver's license we are prohibited from speeding it doesn't matter who we are but we cannot speed and that condition is applied and then we can park in some places and some places we cannot park, right? So those are the dispensations. They're optional, they're not mandatory, but if you are coming to UMBC and you don't have a parking permit, then it'll be very difficult to park, right? Um, so this is how the rules are embedded in uh, regulations and um, in policy documents. So we, I can give you some examples that we had, like for example, customer must provide Google with a server log to show that there was a connectivity loss, right? So if you had the service went down, uh, how can Google prove that the service went down? You have to give them your log to demonstrate it went down. Um, at our description, disc, uh, discretion, we may issue a service credit, right? So this is sort of a dispensation. They may deny you a credit if the service went down because of you know reasons that they had no control over, for example. And so those are uh, some statements we were able to extract from uh, the service level agreements. And so for these are some of the... Um, uh, verbs and nouns and words that we use to extract the various uh, deontic rules. And so we use gra grammatical rules to extract the deontic logic. You know, permissions would have actor, model, verb, and verb, and then you use the basic grammar rules. So, for example, if you see on the right, you have the service credits may not be transferred or applied to another account was a statement in the SLA. And we identify that this is a noun and uh, 
what are the uh, deontic, uh, you know, uh, permissions, prohibitions uh, cannot be transferred or may not be transferred. That's a prohibition in some sense that is not being allowed. And so we know that the service credit cannot be now transferred, right? So this is how we were able to parse it. So apart from the service level, there was the another stay, um, uh, document that we were looking at, which were the privacy policies. This was very interesting because um, there is no standardized format for privacy policies, but the uh, regulators and most of the state governments uh, require that we every vendor has a privacy policy if they are collecting any private information, right? So these privacy policies uh, or terms of service, these are sort of a legal agreement between the provider and the consumer. And then if they lay down the policies on how and data is going to be exchanged um, and how the data can be stored and managed. Um, so they're very important for uh, ensuring uh, or uh, protecting users' rights. So we looked at some of the approaches um, and this is um, in additional, this is another project we have looked at and how uh, vague these privacy policies are. There's a lot of ambiguity, there's a lot of vagueness associated with the privacy policies that keeps makes them open to interpretation, right? So as a consumer, I may think the privacy policy, my privacy uh, rights have been violated, whereas the privacy policy may be very vague about it. And so the um, uh, provider may actually say, well, you know, I agreed to take it, this data and store it encrypted, but, you know, I also agreed to share it with a third party for analysis, et cetera. So the vagueness element was very interesting that we used to measure. Um, this is just a big overview of the knowledge graph that we have. Um, and uh, as you can see, it is, it, it is uh, the older version, but you know, it's, it's still getting complex where we're looking at service level agreements and how the providers, what the providers terms are, what are the metrics and measures that they're using to support it. Uh, if they're giving rebates, how does that affect how, what is the penalty if the service goes down and things like that. And we were trying to capture um, service level agreements of, you know, large number of uh, providers. I think we have about 300 service level agreements that we have been capturing and trying to see if, if there is a pattern coming out, if there is some knowledge that is common across and how that can be used. So let me just give you some examples. So in 2016, so we remember we began this in 2013. So it's been a long time, but in 2016, uh, we looked at some of the statements and how uh, and compared it with the deontic statements. Now, as I told you, deontic statements are the ones that contain the knowledge, right? The other statements were just legalized, which may or may not be used for automating the uh, compliance. So if you observe um, on the left, you had Google Cloud and uh, Azure Cloud, which had a significant number of statements. But when you actually get, went down to the ones that had the deontic rules, they were way less. So if you were to open a Azure uh, service level agreement, it will be very long, very complex. And um, most of the human beings will be like, oh, I don't understand this. I'm just going to go ahead. But, you know, the, the statements that matter, the statements that are going to be then argued in court of law, if you will, are the ones in orange. Right, so those are the ones that uh, uh, influence uh, or affect uh, how the service is provided, how the service is managed and uh, deployed across the cyberspace. Um, if you notice, we did uh, observe that, uh, so for example, IBM reduced their number of model words by 2019, they, uh, but Amazon, for example, in three years, introduced way more statements than it was. Their initial service level agreement was quite simple, but then they increased uh, their uh, the verbiage in their document, if you will, and they also inclu included the, or rather increased the do's and don'ts, what you can do or you cannot do. Um, so this was interesting to observe um, how in three years, um, the providers were changing their you know approach on how data was being managed. And in some sense, it does reflect that. That's what we believe. So uh, the privacy policy uh, to develop uh, the uh, knowledge graph for that, we use the NIST standard uh, uh, standards for it. So NIST has special publications 800-144 and 800-53, which specify what privacy uh, policies uh, guidelines uh, for data, as well as what are the controls that should be included in the cl federal cloud computing standard. So this was very useful for us to, um, as a ground truth, as what we can regard as knowledge, right? So privacy policy, the main classes were the collection purpose. Why is the data being collected and what transformations could potentially happen in the data? 
what uh, protection is being included in the data, like whether it's encrypted behind a firewall, anonymized, etc. Is it going to be shared and with whom? Um, do you have a consent of the uh, user whose data you've collected? And how can that use consumer access the PII to modify their PII if they want to? So this is a knowledge representation that we have of the knowledge graph. Um, as I told you, it looked, privacy policy consisted of five main classes, and then we uh, were trying to import, and um, I think we did about 200 uh, or, or more maybe um, since then, privacy policies that we have been trying to store in this knowledge graph and then automatically um, you know, or reason over them. One of the other changes that we, or rather one of the extensions we did was use blockchain uh, to review um, whether the privacy policy is compliant or not, and then keep an audit track of every data exchange or every data share. And that, that again has some interesting results that, uh, again, um, because of paucity of time, I will not be able to share in this, but if you're interested, I can uh, share the paper with you guys. We looked at some of the model uh, rules that are being used, and um, this was the outcome. And so if you notice, uh, this is some of the model rules in the privacy policies. So the ones I showed you previously was the service level agreements, but the privacy policies like Oracle, for example, had way more rules about how data is going to be stored and what can be done with it. And um, Amazon and WhatsApp had very little in their privacy policies, right? So large part of the privacy policy was uh, general legal verbiage. Another interesting analysis we found that uh, most of the privacy policies had uh, were either applicable to the consumers and providers, which was good, but a huge number, one third of it almost, was the one that influenced third party, right? And the interesting thing was in the privacy policy, they just called it third party. They did not specify who that was. And so when we were trying to find out who these third parties are, it's so difficult, right? So if you sign up for a privacy policy agreement, um, with Alphabet or Google, they say, oh, we'll share the data with all the Alphabet subsidiaries. Now, it was very difficult for us to find these third-party subsidiaries online. I mean, it wasn't very apparent. So I have no idea with whom Google is sharing my data, right? And and so it's true for others, unless they actually drill down to find it. So a huge number of uh, um, rules or regulations or policies um, were applying to third party, which are not specified in the privacy policy. This we think it could be a sort of a, a, a big concern for the consumers because they want to know who, with whom the data is being shared, right? Not just being broad and say, oh, we might share your data with third parties. Um, so, so that so far I covered the um, privacy uh, uh, policies and service level agreements. Any any questions? Any curiosity um, that I could answer? Um. Yes, I, I have a question. I find this very fascinating and I, I firstly want to thank you for presenting. Um, you mentioned the vagueness element of the privacy policy in terms of agreement statements when you were uh, extracting the rules um, right. via the, the uh, beyond tick logic. And I was wondering regarding when you were looking at the cloud service mm -hmm. legal documents specifically, did you find anything that surprised you um so uh, in in terms of the vagueness or in terms of the uh, uh the agreements themselves agreement themselves so the the this uh, that i was sharing with you is and mm -hmm. how dynamic these agreements were so even though we might have signed up one agreement they were constantly updating it every six five three to six months we observed right and then you know many and times it's, it's on the user to Exactly, really? follow up and find out what mm -hmm. is happening. So for the general public users, many of them will ignore it, so which is a mm -hmm. big challenge, right? But the organizations, they pay much attention to it because you know that's mm -hmm. their bottom line. And so they have to dedicate way more resources in just doing this, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I was talking mm -hmm. to someone in IBM and they said 60% of their staff is involved in compliance because that's how much compliance is now gonna be required going forward. We're talking about huge need for you know complying with those regulations, and for the user to be aware of these changes, yes. right? Yes. So that absolutely for us is, is I think going forward this is going to be a big challenge because this in three years we observed the major change. I I mm -hmm. bet you that you know even as we are speaking, um, policies are being changed and unilaterally done. It's not. It's very fascinating. Mm -hmm. 
So we, we yeah. find that too. And the other thing that we found fascinating was, um, uh, I think I had that in, no, I had it ahead, was the number of statements um, that actually uh, were there, the modal statements. Right. So there were a lot of legal jargon, like we may do this, we may do this, we can right. share with third party, which are not defined. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that for us was like, oh, well, which third party? So the word just third party was put in. And so, I mean, like this is the 33% of those third party actors. Yes. So that was again, challenging. And we want to continue this path and find out more as we go ahead every two, three years review and see what happens. Is the, is the industry changing? Is it not? As a as a follow up, what is your uh, inclination? What is your sense of why you know going back to the slide that shows um, the actual uh, terms versus like the the blue the blue orange graph? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. What what is your your um, sense of why there's such a discrepancy here, or why there's so much more? in total number of statements versus statements with the model words. Right, so so this I think is historical because in the past when software was actually purchased, you know, you got physical uh, version of the software if you go to the store, you buy it. So they would have then the uh, legal, uh, you know, statement saying, this is the software you purchase as is, and you know, if it gets spoiled, we'll replace it, but you know, these are the limitations. So many of the, uh, service uh, level agreements or policies were just, you know, they reused what was the previous model, which was uh, directly purchasing the software as opposed to storing it on the cloud, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, then they also had competitors like uh, Amazon, for example, the new players, they said, oh, we'll keep a very simple service level agreement, one page only, you don't have to worry about it, right? Which obviously meant they did not cover every aspect, especially with the mm -hmm. data protection. Um, so now we are seeing a sort of a synergistic, um, you know, sort of a blend, if you will, wherein the old players like Microsoft, uh, you know, which is Azure, Oracle, these guys are reducing the number of statements and trying to make it easy to read. And the young players are now increasing the number of statements because they are facing some legal challenges. And so the legalize has come back, um, but they are not needed for data protection. So we concentrated only on the data protection, right? That makes sense, and so, yes. Right. And so some of those modal terms are less, but then we did observe that um, the way the privacy policies are written and to our surprise, we found you don't need a lawyer to write a privacy policy. So you and I can write a privacy oh, policy. Oh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> you know, anyone that's can fun. write a privacy policy. You don't need a lawyer to validate it. So uh, that's why, uh, but most of these are written by lawyers and then they include the verbiage simply because they want to ensure, and sometimes their jurisdiction needs, sometimes they are like, oh, we have to make it, you know, vague enough so that if somebody questions us in court, we can argue about it. I mean, that, that's the way the legal uh, framework works. There's nothing right or wrong about it. They have to make it ambiguous so that um, it's broad and covers everything. So they say, oh, data is encrypted. They can't say data should be encrypted in this version of the software or this you know, level of encryption because it'll get obsolete very quickly. So these rules and laws are supposed to last a long time, more longer than the technology lasts. And so they are by design vague. Um, and as computer scientists, we are by design uh, very objective, not vague at all, right? We hate vagueness um, and computers can't work with vagueness, at least right now. They may in the future, who knows? Um, so there is this mismatch between the way the legal and the framework works and the way the computational automation uh, ontology aspect works. Yes, thank you. That's That answers my question perfectly. It's very fascinating. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So let me just please um, summarize some of the related previous work, especially with regard to consent. Uh, which one did you? What um, previous work has been done in this general area, similar to what you're doing, especially with regard to the component of it that deals with user consent? Uh, okay, so. Um... So, in in the past, the consent, at least the one that the the legal community looked at, was um, based um, on a physical, um, what do you say, a product, if you will, being delivered to the end user, right? And so most of the consent uh, uh, was specific for that. Um, I have the software with me. I will use it. I'm storing the data within my uh, infrastructure, so I'm fine. 
Um, what problem or rather challenge the cloud brought in is the data is not in your infrastructure anymore. It's on the cloud, which is a remote third party. It is no longer, the software is no longer in our infrastructure. It is again remote in some third party. And the transformations that are being done to the data is again remote uh, in third party. So though, so the consent in the traditional sense, wherein you had ways to um, access the product or the access the data is completely changed now, right? Because the data is no longer with you. You don't know what the third party people are doing. So even if you consent to something, you say, I consent to uh, you storing the data, there is no way to audit whether that thing was met. So that is one of the big challenges that this new approach has brought. So the traditional um, research on consent, which was assuming that you have a recourse in the sense you can validate whether the thing that you consented on is actually happening is now challenging because of the, you know, the black box or, or the seeming opacity of cloud providers. Um, so as an organization, you can enforce it, right? So UMBC, for example, has Google Mail and it has its own privacy policy and regulations that, you know, might uh, have um, UMBC full access to some of the servers that Google has or audit, you know, auditors having server access. Whereas as individuals, there is no way. Especially if you're signed up in a public uh, cloud, there is no way for me to go and say to uh, Google, like, okay, show me my data and where are you storing it and are you duplicating it? So that is, I think, one of the things that is going to be challenging, the way consent is written. And, and I don't know what the solution is immediately. I'm just trying to analyze it. But I think the way consent is being taken for something that you have absolutely no control over right? Your data is not with you. Your software is not with you. Your, um, the whole infrastructure is nowhere accessible. How do you, how do you still control the data? So there, there's another aspect of consent that mm -hmm. interests me, which is, um, having assurance that the user understands what they're consenting to. Oh, this, yes, this, yes. This is extremely complicated. Uh, prior examples that come to my mind include uh, the regulations in the banking industry, um, which make it really clear if you take out a loan, uh, the conditions, the basic conditions of the loan. Mm -hmm. Another example might be with pharmaceuticals. When, when you purchase a, a medication at a drugstore, there are regulations that require it to be really clear what you're getting. Yeah. Um, have you thought about any of those issues and are there any... Yeah proposals for doing something like what is done in the uh, banking industry. Absolutely. So, yes, so this is, has been thought of and actually I was going to cover it in my future slides. So GDPR, which is a um, general data production regulation, European Union mandated in 2018, they identified that this is a challenge, right? People are giving consent to data and they have no idea where the data is going, who's accessing the data, what are the rules? And so they came up with uh, guidelines which every organization has to adhere to, right? Not the consumer. So they move the onus on the uh, providers. Um, and uh, let me just skip this slide. So some of the things that they started uh, looking at is, is consumers and how providers and who can and cannot. So they have to give sufficient guarantees. Um, and what are those guarantees to ensure that the data is being... So one of the rules of uh, GDPR is the data cannot go out of Europe. So if you have a European person's data um, as a provider, you cannot take that data out of Europe, right? So that was one of their um, requirements. So that's why many of the providers had to set up data farms in Europe. They had very strict high fines if any of those data compliance was breached, um, uh, including you know, almost 20 million euros or 4% of their global revenue, which is a steep fire. And of course, if the data was breached, they had to have a supervising authority be notified and every company had to hire what they call a data protection officer. So now any data that is being collected by that company, whatever the consent is, now the, it's onus of the company to ensure that the data is you know, uh, ensured. And so they had uh, obligations, like which was uh, talking about the deontic rules, right? So what can, can be done by the providers, what cannot be done, and the obligations went very deep. Like you have to keep a record of every activity that is ever the process done on any data, you had to keep sufficient data security uh, designs, you know, and then you had to give uh, consumers reviews for their data uh, if you are removing their personal data um, uh, and then cooperate with the supervisory authority. So it's, it's a very rigid, in some sense, to on the providers. 
uh, the obligations that they need to do is, is a lot. Um, okay, this was just the approach for us. How do you automate it? But you know, just to give you the consumers also had some responsibility. So they had to, for example, understand what they are consenting to. Uh, right. And so they had to understand some of the personal data that they are sharing and what happens with that. Uh, they couldn't say, I agree and get away with it. Like, And so um, they looked at, you know, if you, their data is being breached, how the communication comes in from the uh, provider and how the uh, consumer is using that provider and things like that, uh, or rather using that uh, communication. So they had these articles which are very clearly defined. And then they looked at some of the, you know, processing capability. They have to hire a protection officer. And some were across, right? So notification of our data breach required both provider and consumer to sort of agree that this data breach has happened and, you know, what things are being done. Any compensation liabilities are all specified in these regulations. Um, what has to be done? Um, so Euro, Europe has a very strict guideline. U.S. doesn't. So in US, what has happened is every state has come up with their own guidelines, right? And so California CCPA, the California uh, Protection Act, uh, uh, Data Protection Act, is has many more regulatory this thing needs than say uh, Maryland law uh, regulation has. Does does that answer uh, some of the question you had, Alan? Um, partially, but there are two aspects of my question which I feel are unanswered. So the first okay. part was. What work have other people done similar to yours? Right. And second, um, what work has been done to try to make it easier for the user to understand what's going on? Um, okay. So what? Uh, what and, and and maybe part of that also is to help a user's browser automate the navigation through these this jungle of policy. Right. Um, so, yes, uh, there are there are two prior work or other related work that are being happening. One is the knowledge graph uh, generation. So a lot of, uh, um, uh, I won't say a lot, a couple of them, we just know two, have uh, looked at how to develop knowledge graphs or ontologies for GDPR, right? There is no ontology as we, far as we know on service level agreement or privacy policy. So, so we are some of the, one of the pioneers to look at it from a semantic web approach or a or knowledge representation approach for privacy and service level. There has been work done on GDPR, uh, you know, knowledge graphs. That is the one related. And the second related is on privacy policies. So there's a lot of um, very good research uh, folks like C from CMU and others who are looking at these privacy policies and they are analyzing. They may not be using the same technology we are, like semantic web, but they have been doing deep analysis of the privacy policies and how easy they are to read and oh, the vagueness element I mentioned to you. So there is prior work on that and how easy it is for the privacy policies uh, to be um, understood by the end user. But they are not using the semantic web approach that we're using. So that's our novelty. That makes sense? Thank you. Uh -huh. All right, Kevon. Yes, uh, yeah. thank you. So uh, in my own research, uh, uh, not anything related to what you're doing. Mine was just ethics. And so I did run across the GDPR and um, of course it was um, implemented in May, 2018, right? And then I'm reminded as you're speaking of this incident with Google. So Google based of course in the United States and then works globally. Right. I'm reminded of an incident the in, in 2017 or 2019 where they were they were fined, mm -hmm. uh, I think, uh, upwards of 55, 57 million dollars yes, they because were. they they were found not to be properly just disclosing to users mm -hmm. the data collection mm -hmm. and how it was being targeted for advertising, but as well that their descriptions were too generic and too vague. And I'm I'm thinking and I'm and I want your perspective if. Um, you know, incidences like this where Google is sort of almost routinely being fined and sued in Europe is influencing the way that these providers are formatting, reformatting, rewriting, you know, as you said, some some organizations have upwards of 60% of their staff focused on this. Yeah. I think that uh, the monetary loss is like how, how influential, how much of a determinant is that um, versus right. maybe something like ethics. Well, so I would say 
just pure monetary loss may not be that influential because you know 57 million for um uh, right, uh, he, right. Okay, it's not but it's a reputation loss right so the reputation loss is something like facebook faced right when facebook started using uh, the private uh, you know pictures for advertising purposes on facebook and uh, other things like that or when they said the whatsapp uh, application will no longer you know or rather will merge into facebook uh, da data and will be used by facebook for analysis so there is a big concern about reputation loss in the vendors the, more than the monetary loss um but and also moreover they fear that especially europe uh, is a very, eu is a very big market for them Obviously, if they suffer a lot of such reputation, if they have a, a bad reputation of, you know, violating European laws, there is a potential fear that um, the governments might, you know, ban their app apps, right? There is nothing preventing Europe from saying we don't support Google anymore. We'll build our own version, as, I, as, okay. as has happened in other parts of the world. And so definitely um, the reputation loss is a concern for many large organizations. And so that's why we did see that there um, privacy policies changes, but what we found to our dismay is that they have different privacy policies for different part of the world. Which oh. again, yeah, so they had a privacy policy for Europe, uh, Facebook, for example, and uh, had a different privacy policy for India. And uh, they said, oh, Indian data will share European data. We won't because GDPR prevents us. And so obviously oh. they lost a lot of face in India and then they reverted back and said, no, 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 we'll follow the GDPR in India as well. But yeah, you do see them trying to uh, push the limit. Um, and so we need a standardized or at least uh, regulations that are talking across each other, you know, or to each other, not across, but like, you know, if GDPR is done for Europeans, it should be worldwide, right? Why is okay. South American or Indian or uh, African data not that secure or not that privately maintained as opposed to a European data, you know? So, uh, so things like that are definitely going to, are going to influence. And that's why you see this compliance forest, which is going to just increase. Right. And, and. You know, speaking of the the more strict California laws and and, and certain laws and in, in places uh, across the United States, like Minnesota and, and places like that, are right. there different terms of use depending on the user's location, uh, just in the the United States? Exactly, there is, and so that is why there is a need felt to have a pan U.S. law by maybe for another federal agencies like you know NIST or someone making this law, but there are there are lobbyists from the vendor side as well who don't want it of right course. of course so, so so as an academician it's just fascinating to see how um you know uh, how dynamic that's the word i would like to use these policies are and they keep changing depending on the flavor of the um you know so uh, the previous administration was much more stricter on vendors this administration is not that strict so Interesting. And, and it's always been in many industries. It's not just, you know, this um, big data or the cloud uh, industry, but we've observed it. In... Thank you. <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. it's outside the scope of my research. So. No, yeah, no, no, it's just, it was just very fascinating. Right. Um, I did also want to just quickly sort of switch gears and ask you how useful you found the uh, CMU link parser for pattern learning. Um, that's not something that I'm very familiar with. It, it was, it's good for it. So we did not do two detailed ones, mm -hmm. uh, but it's definitely a good one to start with. Okay. I would recommend that. Oh, there's uh, the CME and then there's a Stanford uh, part of speech, POS tracker. So those two are, are the ones that I recommend for people who want to start on part of uh, speech tagging. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So I think I'm almost like only 10 minutes. So let me just quickly show you some other. So this is like the complex uh, GDPR knowledge graph that we created, some of the classes that we had. And the, the interesting thing was we linked it to the Cloud uh, Security Alliance um, uh, uh, ontology, rather their controls. So they had some controls defined for what the cloud provider should do. And then we were able to associate that with the GDPR um, uh, articles and show that if you apply this control to your cloud infrastructure, then these articles will be, you know, ad adhered to and met. And so we then looked at some of the um, privacy policies of the um, big data, you know, providers, and then we tried to see in which category do they fall in and how they are referencing it and looked at some of their permissions and obligations that they have, um, how they applying to the GDPR's permissions and obligations um, and um, uh, how that can be, you know, analyzed. And then we looked at some of the uh, words, uh, similar words that are there in GDPR, 
um, and then see how they are commonly reflected in the privacy policies. Now, this was challenging technically because GDPR is its own beast, it's it, its own uh, you know vocabulary, if you will, its own jargon. The privacy policies that had their own jargon. How do you match? How do you compare the two? That was uh, one of the uh, you know uh, how do you do the semantic similarity? That was a technical challenge. Um, so we looked at some of the other policies, like say privacy policies of uh, Dropbox or PayPal, and see how do they specify what key terms are they specifying? It? What are the ones that you, GDPR or other regulations specify? We also have looked at uh, the credit card industry standards and developed a concept for that. And this is the integrated GDPR credit card uh, ontology knowledge graph, which is looking at um, some of the obligations. So GDPR is the overarching that has way more regulations and articles and rules than the underlying PCI DSS council, which is specifically only for credit card data. Um, looked at some of the controls that are part of it and how those controls are tying to the PCI standards for uh, data protection. And we also looked at some mobile wallets and how we found that there was no single regulation for mobile wallet, which was fascinating. So we came across seven regulations that actually touch mobile wallets in various uh, approaches. And then we looked at how we can integrate that, those, uh, and, you know, took four of those regulations to then build a knowledge graph. A knowledge representation of those uh, various um, um, regulations, uh, you know, requirements and uh, articles and things like that. And looked at some of the deontic expressions that might be existing um, in uh, those articles or rather in those regulations. And then this is just a demonstration of how we were able to show. So, for example, if you had a consumer, what liabilities will the consumer have to do in case of fraud? We were able to extract all those from the regulations. So here on the left, you see the mobile wallet and integrated ontology, and it is able to see here whether there's a consumer liability with the TILA regulation and how that applies here. Um, and we also have looked at health regulation in HIPAA and how that can be associated. So we have, that's another big knowledge graph. But I won't go too much deep into it. Uh, just open up for more question answers. And thank you very much. <laughs> Are, are there more questions? Well, I have one more. Um, what are your future plans? And if there's students out there who want to work with you, um, how can they get involved? Oh, okay. I sorry, I forgot the last slide which had my name. But I would love to collaborate with any student who's interested. Just shoot me an email, you know, or go to our website, nac.umbc.edu or carta.umbc.edu if you're interested in Carta projects. Um, and, you know, um, would love to exchange, uh, you know, ideas, brainstorm ideas. I have uh, 5 PhD students currently working on it. 1 of them just graduated and, um, she was the 1 who worked majorly in GDPR, you know, regulations and how to automate it. And now she's going to become an assistant professor at, uh, Texas A&M, uh, uh, central Texas, TA, Tamu central Texas. So, it's, um. I'm looking for students who want to work on that side of things, GDPR automation, uh, policy automation. Um, I have students who are working on cloud data encryption approaches. So if anyone is interested in that, I would love to discuss. Going forward, what do we want to do? We want to continue this path and see if we can build an integrated knowledge graph and how can it reason across regulations. Uh, one of the challenges we face is semantic similarity, right? So every regulation has its own terms and words and even though they're talking about the same concept, they're talking about different, we're using different words for that. And so to have a system that will automatically understand that if article one is violated in GDPR, it also means article six in PCID or so whatever, that is the going forward challenge. But if anyone's interested and we want to pursue that. Uh, have you looked into exporting these graphs into rules like more developer focused tools? Um, uh, uh, well, we, so we have, we haven't actually, uh, so that is one of the things that we want to work on is having a UI, a user interface to 1 of these graphs right now. They are still only storing data and then we just use sparkle, um, user interface, which is very primitive, but we would love to have some more user develop focus tools, you know, where the consumer can enter their concerns and then we can query across the knowledge graphs to get it. But yeah, that would be an interesting idea to pursue. Thanks, Ryan.
but we are always looking for people who want to collaborate and i'm sure there's a lot of interest because this is very fascinating uh, research yeah go ahead just just one more question i i'm so sorry um i was wondering um if you found if you were impressed by any of the um legal documentations that you found that, that if you found any that were um you know very very moral very uh clearly written perhaps or uh user friendly or something that had um you know mo most companies as as you were talking um uh, sort of try to almost weasel out of these privacy laws did you find any that um did the opposite um so uh, so so this is the this uh, vagueness research that i mentioned to you right so we we extracted some about 100 or more uh, policies and then tried to see how, which ones were least vague right so the and then in that we used a readability score to see you know how readable they were um and so uh, it's interesting it's just a preliminary research we found so yes there were some that were more readable but then mm -hmm. at the same time they left out a lot of details if you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right so as soon as you go into details it becomes unreadable in some sense right so it's, 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 it's the same concern about uh, readability versus um, comprehensive you know mm -hmm. uh, text mm -hmm. so definitely they were there and, and and as i mentioned these are very dynamic documents so sometimes you know they make it easy to read and then they discover that they're not covering everything then they make it difficult to read you know so they, they seem to be going right. through the cyclic uh, process Thank you. So there is not not one I would recommend, but yeah, I can definitely share the results of that vagueness uh, test that we did, and mm -hmm. the ones that were the least vague were the easiest to read. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. That concludes our session, and we'll be back in two weeks. Thank you, everybody.